First John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. In every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and, and ask that you would teach us, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that we would be able to see you lifted and glorified tonight. You are the great teacher. So send your spirit and teach me tonight. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 <clears throat> this is the last of the tests that we come across in the book of 1 John. Remember, we're talking about our theme for the year is becoming disciples. And um, so we are talking about themes and things that will help us to become more like Jesus this year. And so we looked at 1 John because 1 John challenges us to examine ourselves, to test ourselves, to make sure that we are in the faith. And 1 John gives us a lot of things that we need to test. One of the things he tells us is we need to examine to make sure that we have forgiven others and that we are loving others, including our enemies. There are a whole lot of people who claim to know Jesus Christ and to be one of his children and one of his, their, his followers, but in their heart they're still filled with unforgiveness and hatred and bitterness and, and, and they don't want anything to do with not just one or two people, but oftentimes a whole group of people that they don't want anything to do with and don't want them to be around and they don't want to associate with them. And Jesus said, no, 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 you can't love, excuse me, you can't hate your brother and claim to know me. There's a contradiction there. And then it talks about sin and how God takes sin seriously and we need to take sin seriously and we need to walk and live in holiness and righteousness, seeking after God and seeking to be an example to others. And most of the things that we've talked about in these tests have all dealt with how we live our lives. Now he's going to change steps here a little bit. And he's saying, yes, it is of supreme importance how we live our lives. But there's another point, and that is, it's important who you believe in and what you believe about them. It's not just enough to be a good person. It's not just enough to, to claim to know God. It's not just enough to love others and be good to others and serve others. It's not just enough to run from sin and, and talk about sin. And, 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 and we got a whole lot of people that are good at that. <laughs> sin inspectors. <laughs> But he said, it's not enough to do and talk about that, those things. It matters what you believe about Jesus Christ. In fact, what you believe about Jesus Christ is the supreme thing. Because all of what we've been talking about is how we are, are to live our lives, but we can't live our lives unless we met, met the one who created our lives, Jesus Christ, and had an encounter with him. And so he says something here. 
in verse 1, it says that we are to test the spirits rather they are of God. We, we live in a day, and, and through this book, because this book talks about it, I really hammered it, and, and, and I apologize if I seem like I'm against everybody. I'm not. There are a whole lot of good churches in the city of Long Beach that are preaching the gospel that love Jesus Christ of all persuasions. But there are, there's also a growing movement that is veering away from God's truth. And, and <laughs> this morning I went uh, to, a, to a store and I know the lady that was working there and uh, she brought up the question. She said, you know, I just don't understand. You know, if, 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 if God is real and the Bible is real and the church is true and all of this stuff, how can there be so much confusion out there and how can God allow all that to happen? And we got into a whole conversation about that. And she's not the only one who has issues with that. There are a whole lot of people, maybe some of you sitting here saying, well, I don't understand how it is that, that there could be so many churches and so many doctrines and so many ways out there. The bottom line is it doesn't matter what church you belong to. It's what do you believe about Jesus Christ? You say, well, wait a minute. There's even all kinds of beliefs about Jesus Christ. Some, of, some people believe that Jesus was real, that he, was, he existed, but he was just a good man, ex an example. He was a teacher or he was a prophet, some mystic out there that, that got some uh, revelation and some truth that, that we should take and analyze and apply some of that to our lives. But, but to say that he was any more than that is an exaggeration. There's a internet site uh, in Spanish that's dedicated to proving that Jesus never existed. He wasn't a real man. He wasn't a, a real person. He was just this mythological character like Santa Claus that people 2,000 years ago made up and, and, and as a story to tell their children to make them walk along the right path. There are other people that believe that, that Jesus was born a man and, and then he lived his life and then when he was baptized by John, that that's when the deity fell upon him and that's when he became God. And there's all kinds of thoughts and theories about who Jesus was. And Jesus, John says here, it is important. It is so important. First of all, let me, let, me, let me go back a step here. Jesus himself said, there are going to be a whole lot of false prophets out there. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised if Jesus told us it was going to be there. And the apostles uh, in, in the New Testament tells us that they're going to be there. In fact, they were already there. It shouldn't surprise us that there are so many creeping up around us today. But John goes a little further here, and he says, this is so important what you believe about Jesus Christ, that if you get this messed up, messed up you are deceived, you have received and are following a bad spirit, a spirit of deception and a lie, and this spirit is not just some neutral force out there, but this spirit is actually a spirit of antichrist that is being against Christ. Even though they may talk about Jesus and they may use the Bible and they, and, and, and they may be good people and do good things. If they don't believe and write about Jesus Christ, they are lost. And they are an antichrist fighting against Christ. Isn't that a great feel good message tonight? <laughs> And here's what he says in verse 2. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. 
And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. I want to take some time tonight and look at what the scriptures have to say about Jesus Christ being of God. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to quickly go through a number of scriptures tonight. Isaiah chapter 7. Pray for me as I try not to get off and preach a message on each one of these verses. <laughs> In verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The virgin herself shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel. And what does the word Emmanuel mean? God with us. So this virgin, who is a virgin? Mary. When she conceived and gave birth, she gave birth to Jesus. And Jesus, once she conceived and gave birth to him, he was Emmanuel, God with us at that point, at that moment. Not later. He didn't become, he didn't grow, and at some point in time become the, 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 the Savior. When he was born, he was already Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. Now this is a child. The child that's going to be born. Who is a child? Jesus. Jesus. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. What's the next one? Mighty God. God. The child, while he's in the manger, is the Mighty God. Amen. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God. And the Word was God. God. Go down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. God became flesh. Romans 8.3 For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. What is he talking about that the law could not do? The law could not save us. That's what he's talking about. God did by sending His own Son. So the law couldn't do it. The law couldn't save us. So God sent His own Son. In the likeness of sinful flesh. God sent His Son. Now notice it says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why in the likeness of sinful flesh? Because he had no sin. He, that's why he was born of a virgin. That's why the fact that he was God and that he was born of a virgin is very important. People try to take that virgin birth out and try to discount it, pretend like it never happened, it never existed, it wasn't real. No, the virgin birth is very important. Because his father was God, therefore he was born without sin. He was God, and even though he had flesh, and he wore flesh, he did not have any sin in his flesh, which made him perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. <laughs> <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. You guys with me so far? Amen. Verse 7. Actually, let's go up to verse 5. 
Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now let, let me explain this a little bit, because what this is saying in the Greek is a little different because it almost makes it sound like, well, he looks like God and appears of God. No, 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 no. What this is saying in the original Greek is, is this is a stamp of exactly what God is was stamped in Jesus Christ. In, every, in other words, everything that you see about God is in Jesus Christ. And Christ later tells us, if you want to see the Father, you need to look at me. It's the exact, everything that God is, Jesus Christ is. Why? Because he's God. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and becoming in the likeness of men. So God is in heaven. He's got all of God, Christ is in heaven. He's got all of his glory. And I left my jacket in the back, so I can't illustrate for you, but that's all right. So he's up there, and, and, and he is God. He is with God. He is God himself. And he looks down, and he sees the condition of mankind. He loves us so much that God the Father sends him, and he makes a decision to come. So he steps down out of heaven into the womb of Mary, and he is God, a very God, from the moment that he stepped down, and he stepped down and took on a fleshly garment. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And John doesn't say, you know, that's all right. This is what I believe, and if you don't believe it, that's okay. We all have the right to believe what we want to believe, and hey, is that what he says? No, sir. He says, no, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, then not only are you not of God, but you are actually against God. God. That's heaven. Let's look at one more verse. John chapter 20. Because you see, some people, there are some commentators who believe that what he's really talking about is after the resurrection. That he was God and he was uh, like God, but he really, after the resurrection, he didn't have a physical body. And so, or churches believe that he didn't have a physical body. It was just a spiritual resurrection. And they believe that John is actually talking about this. Go to John chapter 20, verse 23. Excuse me, 24. Now Thomas, called the twin of one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to uh, the disciples, and they were all there but Thomas. Thomas was off hiding someplace. He didn't believe that Jesus actually could or would rise from the dead. Verse 25, The other disciples therefore just said, said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of his nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. There's a whole lot of people like that today. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, All right, Thomas. Here I am. You wanted to see? Here's the nail prints in my hands. You wanted to see the scar? Here, could you imagine that? Here, you know, his 
You know, they didn't wear pants in those days. They had tunics, you know, so they had to pull it up, hike it up. Here it is. There it is, Thomas, touch it. <coughs> Thomas looked at it. He touched it. How can you touch a spirit? You can't. And what did Thomas do? He fell down on his knees and he cried out, My Lord and my God. He was God when he was born. He was God when he died. He was God when he resurrected. He was God when he ascended. He is God sitting at the right, standing at the right <coughs> hand of the Father. And he will be God when he returns for you and for me. He was resurrected with a resurrected body. And the Bible tells us that he is the first fruits. And that each and every one of us, one day, we're going to wake up and we're going to have the same resurrected body, physical body that he had only recreated and remade where there'll be no death, no dying, no suffering, no tears. Arthritis won't be there no more. I just discovered I got arthritis in this thumb. Y'all will have a nice Smooth head like mine, so we won't have to wear all that. And you won't have to look at your clock and say, Man, it's sad. five o'clock and i got to go down to church. If I don't leave now, I'm not going to make it. I just don't feel like getting up. No more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more heartache. It is not just important, it is key to what we believe in who we are. Romans 10, 9. <clears throat> that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, there's two parts to this. One is, confess with your mouth. But look at the other part. You have to believe in your heart. What, what, what Paul is saying here in the book of Romans is many of us, with our lips, we say, oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe, I believe that Jesus was God. I believe that he rose from the dead. I believe all these good things about him, but it's all up here. And Paul is saying that is not enough. You have to move it down 12 to 8 inches. It has to become part of your heart part of you, who you're being, because once you realize and recognize as Thomas did, who Jesus Christ was, that he was and is and forever will be King of kings and Lord of lords, he is mine and our God, whether you accept him or recognize it or not. Once we get to that point, then something we fall down as Thomas did and we cry out, my Lord and my God, then something happens within us. We have a heart transplant, a heart change. And out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. So now we're able to go ahead and confess and talk. Jesus is Lord. And it not just be lip service. It's coming from our heart. Because not only do we think it. We believe it. We live it. And he is actually the Lord of my heart and my life. Amen. The problem is many of us. Don't let it get down that far. My, my famous word, practical atheist. <laughs> yes, I believe, I believe, I believe, but do you? Because if you truly believe that Jesus was God, that Jesus died for me, then it, you, you would surrender your heart to him and allow him to work in and through you. Finally, quickly, I want to talk about why. 
Why would God be in heaven, have everything, then look down <coughs> and look at my losses, look at your losses, your sin, and be willing to step down out of heaven for me and you because I got news for you. I love you, but I'm staying up here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. But his love and compassion moved him. <coughs> Why? Five things, and I'm just going to mention these rapidly. The first one is to put the law and religion in its place. See, a whole lot of people have taken their belief in Christ and switched it for religion. And it's just become a, a bunch of legalism, a bunch of do's and don'ts and laws and rules and regulations that they know that they can't keep. Many of them have stopped trying. But, but, but yet, they take these laws and these, the, the, they, they, they try to put this facade up, this mask to let people think that they're trying to live them and that unless you follow these rules and these regulations, you are not going to make it in. I don't know if you were there or not, Rudy, but years ago we used to work for this uh, group, uh, group of these there. <coughs> and they were in their house and had their own recording studio in there. And this pastor and his family was coming over to record. Problem is, all the women had pants on in the household. So as soon as they got the phone call, they were on their way. The, man, the father of the house and all of the women, his wife and the girls, to quickly <coughs> run in and put dresses on. Because you had to live in holiness and wear pants. Now, I mean, we're skirts. You want to know what the problem with all this is? I know the pastor and the people that were coming over, and they wear pants in their house, and they put them on to go over there. <laughs> it's not about pants. It's not about drinking or not drinking. It's all about Jesus. And the reason why he came, he said that, that Moses gave the law. But grace and truth came to Jesus through Jesus Christ. He came, he became a man to show and demonstrate truth and grace to us, to model it, to live it. So that we could apply it to our lives. Secondly, to elevate people, to lift them up, to give them the right place. You, why do we have all these religions and laws? Why would we put pants on to please, or skirts on to please somebody? Why would we do that? Because in our mind and our heart, we're really trying to keep people down. But Jesus came and said, no, I elevate you. You're more, you're worth more, you're more valuable than some written law in the Old Testament. Jesus was walking through the fields with his disciples and Clicking some wheat and eating them. And they said, Look at Jesus, what your disciples are doing. They're sitting, they're, they're eating on the Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus said, Well, they're hungry. He said, Don't you remember what David and his men did? He said, you, 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 You've got to twist it, you've got to backwards. God didn't just create laws and said, okay, I'm going to create people so that they can obey them. No. He created the law to help us and to show us that we would come up short. And he elevated people to its rightful place. He came to live and be an example he who has seen me has seen the Father. It's one thing to talk about forgiving others and, 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 and having mercy and grace on the sinners. It's another thing to actually stand there and watch Jesus forgive 
a prostitute. It's one thing to say Jesus loves and forgives everybody. It's another thing to watch Jesus go and touch those that nobody else wanted around. It's one thing to say that Jesus loves me and is full of compassion. It's another thing to stand there and watch Jesus feed 5,000 hungry men plus women and children. <coughs> he came to be an example. Hebrews 4.15 says he was tempted in every way just like we are. He came to, be an, he, he came to identify with us. What is it that you're struggling with that you can't seem to let go, that you don't understand? And, and, and here's the thing, we think we're the only ones. It's a whole lot of people, you're in good company. Because there's a whole lot of people struggling with the exact same thing. And, and he came so that he could identify with us, so when he is up there, making intercession for us, he knows exactly what he's talking about and what he's doing. Because he has been through the struggle, yet without sin. See, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's what you do with the temptation. And Jesus was tempted in every way, just like we are. And yet he walked through it in victory. And then finally, and most important, his greatest reason and greatest mission for coming was he came to die <coughs> so that his shed blood could wash and cleanse my past, my sin, my present, my future. And then he rose again from the dead and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And all power is in his hand. And then he gives us a promise that if you would just come to him, he is strong enough to hold you in his hands and never, ever let you go or let you down. He who has began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Well, I just got to do more. No, just trust in him. I just got to change. No, just trust in him. What, what, you don't understand? I need to. No, you don't need to do anything. Just surrender. And let Him do His work in you. That's all you have to do. And Jesus came in the flesh. Do you believe it? God incarnate. Try to wrap your head around that. Try to wrap your heart around that. The truth of what that means. It will challenge you. It will change you forever. Our God is an awesome God. And He loves you. And he stepped down out of heaven for you to give you new life and life abundantly and life eternal. All you have to do is, like Thomas, say, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and we thank you. That you are God. And that you stepped down out of heaven. And that you died in our place. If you are here tonight. And you have never acknowledged. And never accepted Jesus Christ. Into your life and heart. All you have to do is right now. Right where you are at. Just ask him. To come in. And save you. Change you. Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.